presenter today is Dr. Mark Bernards. Mark is a professor in the School of Agriculture at Western Illinois University, WIU. He earned his PhD at Michigan State University and MS and BS at Brigham Young University. Prior to joining WIU or Western in 2011, he worked as an extension weed specialist for the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Each year, Mark teaches principles of crop science, integrated pest management, weed science, no-tillage farming, and crop ecology and management. He advises the Agronomy Club and coaches the WIU, sorry, WIU Weed Science and Crop Science teams. Mark directs agronomy operations at WIU's Agricultural Field Lab, where he conducts weed management and agronomic research in corn, soybean, and pennycress. Please join me in welcoming Mark. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so I'm excited to get to be here today. It's good to see a few familiar faces that I've seen at meetings in Quincy, Quincy and around the western part of the state. Um, this is going to be heavy on the planting green and pennycress and really light on the weed management, but hopefully I'll go through things quickly enough. If you have questions, I can answer some of those. Okay, thanks. All right, so this is, um, I feel really fortunate at Western. We have two farms that we do agronomy research on. The farm on the left is our agricultural field lab. Uh, so it's about 40 acres. You can see it's divided out into plots. Um, I teach all of my labs. I teach in the fall intro to crop science and integrated pest management. And so we use the farm shop as our classroom and then we are out in the field. So if any of you have kids or grandkids that are of student age looking at college and they want a hands-on experience, Western is an excellent place to send them. Um, over on your right is the Kerr Agronomy Farm. And this is a picture that was taken by uh, Google satellites this last uh, September. Uh, you can see on the upper part where it's brown, we had harvested some of our corn for silage. So I want you to go down further in the middle. Um, it's kind of an awkward place to present, but you've got these fields right here. Uh, this is a study that's being funded with some of your fertilizer checkoff, uh, where we have 16 one acre blocks and we're looking at three cropping systems. Uh, one of those is a perennial grain crop called Kernza. Uh, one is a continuous cover where we've got corn, small grain, and wheat. And then we grow a cover crop in between each of those. And the third is a traditional corn soybean. And what we're trying to do, and I really enjoyed Jim's presentation, is we are trying to integrate grazing into that system. Um, so we're measuring water quality. We're looking at soil properties, soil health parameters, and then the economics of getting more cattle into our cropping systems. Um, the big challenge with this particular farm, um, if you look at this bottom field, this is soybeans, this is September, what color should that field be? Green, right? That's pretty brown. And if you look particularly at this corner, we have, um, are surrounded by a number of conservation sites and lots of people's hunting grounds. And there's regularly a herd of 25 to 50 deer that are sampling all of my cover crops. So my yield data has been pretty miserable the last two years. It's like a giant food plot. I plant all these cover crops, they come great all year. There's not a lot left for the cattle and it's their turn to graze. Um, and so I was thrilled. This was a $75,000 fence, but I now have an eight foot fence around the Kerr farm. Um, and as it was going up, the deer were still coming in and out and the soil right here at this particular entrance looked like you'd run a whole bunch of cattle through it. <laughs> there were so many deer prints in that. Correct. So hopefully we will be on the map and some of the data that we get in the future will be more representative of the old food expect. All right, on the WIU farms, my driver weeds are water hemp. This is one field where you can see on the bottom left, we have a whole lot of pressure. Um, we also have areas with quite a bit of maristel and then um, atypical for a lot of farms, but we have cultivated a lot of cocklebird just because it's kind of an interesting weed. We've got lots of morning glory. Um, and the last couple of years, I've really started to see a research um, of fall panicum. I don't know if any of you are dealing with more fall panicum, but it's uh, becoming a much bigger issue on our farm. Um, 
As I mentioned before, we're an undergraduate serving institution. I am really focused in my program on providing research opportunities. Um, so every summer I've had four or five students work for me. Many of those students go on to do presentations at scientific conferences. Um, and I've had a whole bunch go on to grad school at different places. Um, I was visiting, sorry, I've forgotten your name, um, Dr. Singh. Um, he knew a couple of the students that worked in my program that are, went to South Dakota State University, and we've got one that's in Dr. Marginot's program now, too. So great opportunity. We have a nice greenhouse that was built about seven years ago um, where we can do many things during the wintertime. All right, so I like to start all of my talks with my biases, you know where I'm coming from. I am pro-herbicide. I had an experience on an internship where I pulled giant ragweed and velvet leaf for a couple of days that we'd miss spraying and was all about three feet tall and I decided this is miserable. There's a better way to do it. Um, but I think we've got to use herbicides wisely and our track record over the last 20 years has not been fantastic. Um, I am pro no tillage. I'm pretty excited to offer what I think is the only no tillage farming class in the United States. Uh, we've been doing that for the last five years. Um, and I recognize that it's not a perfect fit every place, but I think as many places as we can put that will be beneficial. And I define myself as a recovering crop, cover crop skeptic. Um, anybody heard of Alcoholics Anonymous? Okay. Once you are an alcoholic, what are you? You're either an alcoholic or you're a recovering alcoholic. Okay, so I came uh, when I went to the University of Nebraska based on my education at Michigan State. One of my influential professors made me think cover crops weren't a good idea. Um, at Nebraska, I'm going to share some data. I did some research and it made me question whether cover crops were a good idea. And then I arrived at Western where we have Mr. Covercroft himself, Dr. Joel Gruber, um, and he has rubbed off on me. And I'm very much in favor of trying to incorporate cover crops into our system. Um, the other thing that um, has been pretty influential to me in my teaching is Rachel Carson. How many of you have heard of her? Okay, so she wrote Silent Spring. It was a book that was published in 1962. It portrayed our use of pesticides in a pretty poor light. Um, and I make all of my students in my integrated pest management class read this book. And the uh, angle I take with them is you've got to know what the environmentalists look at as truth. And a lot of what they cite back to is this. And so it gives them um, some understanding. But she had um, a couple quotes that I like. One is, the whole process of spraying seems to be caught up in an endless spiral. Thus, the chemical war is never won. Um, and if you think about how we farm today, what's our answer if we have a problem? Spray it. Spray it, OK? <laughs> And then we come up with another problem, and the answer to that is spray it. Okay, so I think there's a whole lot of truth in that particular statement. Um, another statement she writes, the, the last chapter of the book is focused on biological controls. She says, there are biological solutions based on understanding of the living organisms they seek to control and of the whole fabric of life to which these organisms belong. Her examples are primarily with insects and using insects to fight insects. It's kind of the concept there. Um, I think we still have a long ways to go on biological solutions, particularly in the world of weeds. Um, but it's something that we need to address because if we look at herbicide discovery, that's extremely expensive. If we look at new herbicides coming to market, there are a few, but they're probably not till the end of the decade. Um, we've got to think about other solutions. So that kind of drives a lot of my research and a lot of my thinking, but I am pro herbicide. All right, so let's start with winter cover, cash crop, yield, and weed management. Um, so if you look in this picture, um, if this is a field on the left, you can see a lot of weeds that are big, winter annual weeds. On the right, you can see we got a timely burn down on. If you look at the corn that was planted across that, what do you see? There's a difference. Okay, where we burn down the weeds early, that corn is a lot taller, it's a lot more robust, it's greener. Um, another study, and this relates to a lot of what uh, Mr. Eiserman talked about, we had done a study where we were looking at herbicide carryover on cover crops. We planted the cover crops this direction, we sprayed the herbicides across here. Um, this was rye, this was wheat. You can see we didn't do a lot of damage with any of our herbicide treatments. Um, but we didn't come back and plant that corn or didn't control that until we planted the corn. And you can see this row that's in between. 
does not look nearly as green as these others. Okay, so plants respond to what's growing there when they come up. This is one of my favorite studies that I've done at Western, and it was kind of a, it was almost an accidental study. We'd had a field where we had quite a bit of chickweed. We went out and we'd sprayed the chickweed and we used paraquat in that particular application. We burned a lot of the chickweed plants back, but then they started to regrow. We planted corn into that field and we went out and we marked corn plants that came up adjacent to where one of these little chickweed plants had started to grow. And then we marked other corn plants that were a fair distance from that chickweed. Okay, at harvest, we came back and we pulled ears off of those. So this WFA is the weed free. So that was a corn plant that was growing away from any chickweeds. And then this weedy A right here, the light blue, was from a plant that was growing next to one of those chickweed plants. And we came back and we sprayed out the chickweed about two weeks after the corn came up. So it didn't grow next to the chickweed for all that long a time. But if you look at the size of the ear, what happens when that corn plant grew next to that chickweed plant for two weeks? It's reduced. It's reduced. Okay, and we moved one plant over, even that plant that wasn't directly next to it, the green bar was also reduced. So this has really fueled my thinking. If I'm planting a plant and it's right next to a weed that's already established or potentially a cover crop, it's going to make an impact, which is what I really liked about uh, Jim's talk, wide row cover crops and thinking about that. Um, one of the questions that we asked as we started this study, could we make up the difference if we applied extra nitrogen to the system? And so we had a nitrogen rate component with the study. So we went from zero up to 250 kilograms per hectare, about 250 pounds per acre. The green line represents the weed free. The blue line represents the plants that were next to the weeds. Did that gap ever really close when we added more nitrogen? It didn't. So whatever that corn plant sensed when it first came up persisted throughout the entire growing season. And there's been a lot of really interesting work done, particularly at the University of Guelph um, and the University of Wyoming has done some recently that looks at this concept of plants, especially our crop plants are impacted by what they see when they come out of the ground. Do you have a question? What stage of growth was the extra nitrogen put on? What stage? It was side dressed. Is B6 or later? B4 to B6 yeah. has been when it was put on. Yeah, good question. And what was recommended before is if I plant and there's other cover crops out there, I'd rather put on some sort of banding or supplemental nitrogen. And I think that's a valid philosophy. Mr. So the, the chickweed was removed when, did you say? About two weeks after the corn came up. So it wasn't out there that long. Can you make sure you repeat the question for the folks online? Yes. Okay, so the question was, when did the chickweed come up? And it was about two weeks after. Okay. Thank you for that reminder. Oh, yeah. I'd lose points if I was in the student contest for not doing that. <laughs> I should know because I judged the student contest before. <laughs> okay, so let's go back a few years. This was during my time at Nebraska. Um, while I was there, I did a tour one spring where I just drove around um, a bunch of areas one day. And I was shocked. This was in 2006. We were in the heyday of the Roundup Ready world. And there were all these fields that people had gone out and planted soybeans into, and then they came back with one application of Roundup about two weeks later, and that was their weed control for the year. And the question in my mind is, what are all those winter annual weeds doing to the soybeans? So we set up this study where we looked at controlling the weeds in the fall. So the winter annual weeds were controlled in the fall. Then we started March 15th, April 1st, April 15th, May 1st, May 15th is when we planted our beans, and then we did June 1st and June 15th and we tracked what that yield was. And what we saw pretty consistently, so we did this six site years, and we did it with corn and soybeans. If I waited to control those winter annual weeds until the time of planting, I typically lost between 10 and 15% of that yield potential based on a weed-free winter environment for that field. Right, so this is why I said I came to Western, a cover crop skeptic. If you look at data like this, what does it tell you about cover crops? Maybe I don't want them, okay? Um, and I tried measuring water to see if water was the issue. Nebraska doesn't get as much moisture as Illinois. We had wet springs every time I did this experiment, so I couldn't measure any water differences. Um, and it made me think maybe it's nitrogen, but there was something that was going on. So the, the two questions I asked, I was happy that the Soybean Association funded, 
when I came was number one, our cover crops also going to reduce soybean yield like I saw with the weeds. And number two, winter annuals are a free cover crop. Would they do some similar things to cover crops that we go in and plant in terms of weed management in the summer? Okay, so this particular study looked at this. And with this uh, study, I planted May 15th, which is kind of on the later side in Nebraska. We know, and this is some data that we collected this last year at the WIU farm, the earlier I plant, so in April, the higher the yields, the later I wait into June, was our late June was our last planting, the lower yields. It's a little bit different between the two varieties that we used. But how does this interaction of cover crop removal time relative to soybean planting work? And so we looked at a number of different dates. So in this particular study, we controlled the weeds in the fall or four weeks, two weeks before at the time of planting. And we had three soybean planting dates, one about May 1st, one about May 20th, and one about June 6th. All right, so this chart has lots of things. Let me set it up. Across the top, we have winter annual weed cover. Across the bottom, we have cereal rye cover crop. And then we have our early planting, our mid planting, and our late planting. And you can see these lines represent the yields from either the fall herbicide, four weeks, two weeks, or one week before. So in 2014, what's the trend on every line that you see up here? It slopes down. So it didn't matter if it was cover crop or cereal rye, I saw the same effect. The longer I waited to terminate that winter cover, I had some effect on my yields. All right, fast forward to 2015. Same setup, what do you see on the lines here? Breaking up. Some go up, some go down. There is no measurable story that I can tell. And I think this is probably what farmers have seen. Can you plant green and have terrific yields? Yep. Can you plant green and have things that don't work out? So a lot of this is gonna depend on the years. I think we're improving our agronomy. This was all a solid seeded stand instead of looking at planting in gaps. When I looked at weed biomass, I found and weed counts, I did find that having those winter annual weeds out there, even though there wasn't as much biomass as a cover crop, made an impact on the summer weeds. So we left these plots untreated with herbicides um, and we came back eight weeks later. So this was the fall and the 28 days before, I had a whole lot of weed biomass in the rye and the winter annual weeds. But the longer I delayed terminating that cover crop or the winter annual weeds, the less weed biomass I had. So I am getting some benefit from those winter annual weeds. I get a lot of benefit from rye. All right, it's so my intermediate summary. Winter annual weeds and cover crops function similarly, <clears throat> suppressing some summer annual weed growth. Um, that yield response of soybeans to cover crop or winter annual weed termination varied by year. Um, and water availability, again, in this study we measured did not affect anything. And so I wondered, was this an impact I'm seeing on soybeans having to do with nitrogen tie-up? So I did three years of studies from 2018 to 2020, um, where we looked at terminating the cereal rye two weeks before planting, where we looked at the time of planting. So we planted green and then terminated the day or day after planting. And we looked at nitrogen on those soybeans at the time of planting to see if we could see any impact. If you look at that slope, is there a whole lot of slope to that line? Certainly not enough that it's going to be economic or predictive, okay? Um, but we were seeing something, and so we thought maybe we could try another question. And so this is a, a second study that was funded by the Illinois Soybean Association. Um, we looked at three termination times in this study. We had two weeks before planting, um, zero weeks before planting or planting green, and then two weeks after planting, so we planted the soybean and then came back and terminated two weeks later. We looked at four nitrogen rates, so zero up to 66 kilograms, which would be a little over 75 pounds per acre. And then we looked in two different studies because we didn't want to complicate the wheat and yield. One where it was kept weed free and we looked at just soybean yield response and the second where we looked at weed density and biomass. All right, so this looks at termination time and soybean yield. So in 2000, um, our two weeks before in zero, we had even yields by the delay, delaying that extra two weeks, we saw a drop in our soybean yield. 
In 2021, what did you see? No difference. Okay, soybean seems to be a little bit more plastic or able to overcome that early season competition than what I've seen with corn. All right, when we looked at nitrogen response rate, again, it was consistent with that other study. Um, in 2021, maybe we saw a little bit of slope, but there really was no statistical difference. 2020, it actually went down slightly. But again, no statistical difference. So I would say nitrogen on soybeans at planting is a no-go from an economic standpoint, even with the presence of a cover crop. And when we looked at weed biomass, um, this drives home the same point that we saw on the earlier slide. The earlier I terminate that cover crop, the less benefit I have in terms of suppressing the weeds. Um, so the purple lines represent two weeks before, the gold bars represent zero weeks before, and the green two weeks after. And you can see at two weeks after planting, four weeks after planting, or six weeks, where we terminated that rye early, those weeds got a huge head start where we waited, waited until late to terminate. We kept those weeds suppressed for quite a while. Okay, and I look at a good cover crop as being essentially a weak residual herbicide. I can expect two to maybe four weeks of pretty decent control or suppression of those weeds. Um, I really like what Jim said. If you have a cover crop out there, it makes it easier to stay on label with your post application planning. Okay, we saw the same trends in 2021, not quite as dramatic. 2020, our site had lots of water hemp. This site was more grasses um, in terms of the weed density. Now, this particular slide was a bit of a surprise to me. Okay, soybeans didn't respond that much to nitrogen, but what will weeds do if you put nitrogen on the system? They'll grow. Okay, so we saw as we bumped up our nitrogen rates, what happened to my weed biomass? it also increased, okay? Um, so I think perennially there's a question, should I fertilize my soybeans? When should I fertilize my soybeans? One of my comments to that is now, if you fertilize your soybeans, you're also fertilizing your weeds. Is that really what you want to do? Okay, so that can be a, an impact. All right, so to minimize the risk of yield loss, I think it's uh, pretty sound to terminate two weeks before about the time of planting. Um, Delaying cover crop termination until planting or later really benefits me in terms of my weed management, if that's my goal in the system. And adding fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer, is not a good strategy. All right, any questions to that point? And Stephanie, can you give me a sign when I've got five minutes? Okay. All right, so next I want to introduce Penny Cress as a future cash cover crop. How many of you have had penny cress as a weed in your field? Okay, I've got a whole lot of it at the WIU farm because we have a penny cress breeder there that's been spreading it for the last 15 years. All right, so penny cress has a number of different names. The one that the company that's commercializing that doesn't want to hear is stinkweed. If you've ever walked through it, it has a real strong mustardy smell. Um, fanweed is what it's often called in Europe. Bastard cress is one that I found, which isn't a very nice one. Um, in terms of its scientific name, the Latin binomial is Flaspy R. Vince. And if you think about the seed pods, the flap part means to flatten, and the axis is like a shield. So if you look at those seed pods, they're like a little flat shield. And pretty unique among weeds because they're fairly large. Um, we think it was introduced in North America around 1700. At least the first documentation was from the Detroit area, about 1705, I think. And one of the things that makes pennycress interesting, like mustard, so canola is a mustard, it has a very high oil seed content, up to 36%, and the principal fatty acid is uricic acid, so that is similar to what rapeseed or the, the crop that canola was derived from has. And this is an oil that has quite a bit of suitability for biodiesel. The other thing that's unique about pennycress, if you've been around it, you can go out and it may have been dead and dried for quite a while, but those seeds are still in the seed pod. So it has limited shattering. If I'm looking for a new crop, I want a crop that's going to hold on to its seed or a plant that's going to hold on to its seed. Um, and I want to highlight why I think this is really exciting. If we think about the crops that we grew, grow now, wheat was domesticated about 10,000 years ago, corn about 9,000 years ago, potato 8,000 years ago, soybean, somewhere between seven and 9,000 years ago, depending on whose history you read. 
Sunflower which came from here in North America was about 4,000 years ago. Rape cedar canola was in Europe about the same time. Oh no, it was about 400 years ago. So 1600 CE, common era. Sugar beet is one of the newer crops we have. It was developed from beets in about 1750 because Europe wanted their own sugar source. But beets have been domesticated 4,000 years ago. But we have a new crop that's been domesticated from a weed. So even if you never grow it as a crop, I think just being around or in this time is pretty cool that we've got something new that's coming to market. All right, kind of the domestication timeline. The gentleman that's in this picture is Dr. Terry Isbell. Um, he worked for the USDA, USDA ARS over in Peoria for most of his career. Um, and during the springs and falls, he would help a farmer that was in the area where he lived. He was an oilseed chemist, he wasn't a farmer. And as he helped this farmer, he observed this plant out there, pennycress, and he got to wondering about it. And he did some looking. Back in the 90s, there was a paper that suggested maybe pennycress could be used as an oil seed crop. And so Dr. Isbell uh, began some work at the Peoria lab, the USDA, um, and explored the oil characteristics of pennycress. And then he started selecting weeds out in the field that he thought was interesting and growing those. And so he's really considered the father of pennycress. Um, he shared that with Dr. Pippin at Western Illinois University. Dr. Pippin got involved in it. And then there was a group of scientists that had retired from Monsanto. They were looking for something new to do. They formed a company called Arbogenics and they began breeding pennycress. So Arbogenics had a name change to Covercress in 2018. Um, and this last year, it was acquired by Bayer, Bungie, and Chevron. Uh, and this was strategic on the part of Covercrest. I think Bayer is a supplier of agricultural goods. Bungie does a lot with processing. And then Chevron would be an end user and end distributor. So they feel like they're in a pretty good position to actually take this idea of a newly domesticated crop and deliver it. And the USDA has invested heavily in it. Um, it's a big grant that was awarded to WIU and five other universities in 2019. And in 2020, there was a Department of Energy grant awarded to Illinois State University and some partners. All right, so what makes this unique? So pennycress typically has a black seed. Um, one of the changes that's been made with gene editing is to make those seeds golden color. And this change has been pretty neat. They did it because the black seeded coat has a lot more uricic acid, which isn't good for livestock feed. And they thought if we're gonna get this as a crop, we've got to be able to feed it to livestock or the mill to feed it to livestock. So by getting rid of the black seed coat, they reduce that negative uricic acid. They still have the oil that they want. They've got good pro crude protein for a feed source. And from a weed management standpoint, when they did that, they got rid of the dormancy. So typically, pennycress seed will just sit in the soil for years. And when conditions are right, it will germinate and grow. With this golden seeded, it doesn't seem to persist. So you can plant this without having to worry about having a weed on your farm. Okay, um, and it's being promoted as a cash winter crop. So pennycress, based on the studies that have been done so far, works similarly to rye and our other cover crops in sequestering nitrogen. You're protecting the soil, but the idea is that you're going to be able to harvest it and make money off of that cover crop. Initially, um, it will be used for animal feed, particularly in the poultry industry. And eventually, the idea is this will become a component of bioaviation fuel or sustainable aviation fuel. Kind of the pattern for planting it, um, we have most successfully planted it in by the middle of September. Okay, it's pretty similar to our cover crops. The earlier you can get it in, the better. It forms a rosette by the time we get to October or November, um, and then it will go through some sort of a dormant state. Usually in March, um, it will start to really green up. And in late March or early April, it goes through what we call bolting. So that's where the stem elongates from the rosette. Um, we'll typically get flowering sometime in the first the middle part of April. And then the target is to be able to harvest it in late May or early June. Now the WIU farm, it usually ends up being about the first week of June, has been pretty typical. 
Um, the feeling is as you go further south and the initial commercialization is going to be along I-70, it will be warmer in the winter and they'll be able to pull it out a little bit earlier in the year. All right, so the proposed Pennycrest fits along I-70. Um, the initial idea was to seed it with an air seeder after corn um, and then to plant your no-till soybeans in as soon as you harvest the Pennycrest. Things that I've observed and that others have observed is um, we really want to get it in that by the middle of September. So that's challenging with corn harvest. There's lots of concern about herbicide carryover risk, which I think maybe somewhat overblown. Um, but planting pennycress in the corn residue is not very consistent. Um, so this would be a picture where we took the corn off the silage. You can see lots of pennycress. This is where we left the corn residue. What do you not see a lot of? Pennycress. It's a small weed. It's got big residue. It doesn't grow very well. Um, this was a sort of accidental study. I planted some strips of beans and strips of corn, and then we looked at the volunteer pennycress that we had come up from the previous year's breeding plots. And what do you see with beans? Got lots of pennycress. What do you see with corn? It's a lot thinner. It's a lot greener. It didn't come up as early. So I think they're this isn't a talk saying so go out and plant pennycrass, but I'm giving you ideas of what's coming. I think we're probably going to be looking at soybeans as the preceding crop, and maybe even soybeans after the crop. And we're doing some work with that. Okay, so this is my third study that's funded by the Soybean Association. Last year was the first year we put it out. Um, so June 1st is really much later to plant soybeans than we want. Um, and that would be when we would look at planting after pennycress. So the question we asked is, could we interseed soybeans into pennycress in March or April? So we went out and did this. This was our March 21st planting. You can see the pennycress is growing right there, and we planted the soybeans into that slot. Okay, we also did the same thing with corn. This is pennycress harvest. So you can see the pennycress right here. This is the little combine that Dr. Fiffin has. This is what it looked like from above. You can see these little green soybean leaves in here and the nice penny crest stand. All right, this is another couple of shots. This is after we harvested. You can see the rows of soybeans. We kept the combine up high enough so we didn't clip off too much. But if you compare those soybeans to the soybeans that were no-till planted, what do you see in terms of size? Big difference. Again, as you plant a crop and it comes up next to something that's already growing, it's going to be impacted. All right, um, some of the beans, and I haven't figured out, looked a little bit rough. Others of the beans looked really nice. So we have this study out again this year and we'll be able to evaluate it more. But when we looked at soybean and corn development, um, so we've got growth stage over here. The purple are the soybeans, the yellows are the corn. Where we intercropped the soybeans or the corn, they were about a stage and a half to two stages behind the no-till when we harvested. And that's something that persisted throughout the entire growing season. Um, so over here on the right, you can see soybeans. This was my March and my April planting. It was taken on September 27th. They were pretty much mature. My June 5th after the harvest is still green. And you look over here where they had been intercropped, you still get quite a bit of green. Um, so one of the things we realized after the first year, and we probably should realize this before, we really need to strip till our soybeans into the penny crest so they've got a little bit more space when they come up. All right, when we looked at penny crest yield, this was something that made us pretty happy. We went out and we took subplots where we'd driven over the penny crest with the tires. We took subplots where we had the furrow opener and the closing wheels. And then we had subplots where we hadn't had any disturbance. And when you look at those yields, we had flat yields all the way across. So Pennycrest was pretty resilient to the disturbance that we caused through the planting operation. And our, our dates were specific. When we did the April 10th planting date, it was just starting to bolt. So we hadn't seen stem elongation where we were risking bending off or breaking the stems. All right, but when we looked at uh, Pennycrest yields, we also didn't see any difference from interceding. So it was flat all the way across. Uh, which also made us pretty happy that maybe this will be a viable um, strategy. When we looked at soybean yield, it was negatively affected by the penny crest. So part of our hypothesis was if we could plant March or April, we'd be better off than planting in June. Okay, where we had intercrop with these dark bars, as you look across, they all have a B. We didn't see any yield difference. Okay, we did see a benefit planting earlier um, relative to June in our no-till plots. So the concept here is I think Pennycrest 
has potential as a cover crop. I think we can figure out ways to work soybean into that rotation. Um, and we're making progress on that. So soybean yield was not increased by intercropping. Um, perhaps if we strip till, we can change that scenario. Um, and penny crests impacted the soybean growth of this intercrop. So we saw that persist through the season. So we're going to look at strip till next. All right, any questions on that particular concept? Time. Good. Okay. All right. So, one of the other projects I'm working on, and this is part of that big federal grant, is with the idea that we were going to plant corn before pennycress. What are those corn herbicides going to do to that subsequent pennycress project? And if you think about corn herbicides that may really hurt pennycress, the ones that come to mind are the group 27, the HPPDs, so your mesotrione, Callisto impact that sort of chemistry. And we looked at a whole bunch of these in the greenhouse and in the field. So in the field study, um, the way I set this up is I went out and I sprayed the corn when I would normally spray the corn. And I sprayed it at 1x and 2x rates because I really wanted to ding the penny cress. Um, and then we harvested the corn for silage. In early September, we came back and we planted the penny cress into that. So you can see here the field. Um, that was planted to pennycress over corn silage. And then we went back and assessed the stand and yield. This was the yield from 2022. So the purple bar across the top was where we planted pennycress and there was no herbicide residue. So we just used glyphosate and Liberty to control the weeds in the corn. And then we had all of our single active ingredient herbicides. We had our multiple mixtures and then to really try and cause damage, I put on a 2x of a pre, so Verdict, Corvus, and Acuron, and a 2x of a post, Impact, Caprino, and Halex GT, to see if I could really ding that penny crest. Um, and if you look at my biggest bar, what is it? 2x of Acuron followed by a 2x of Halex. That was not the result I was expecting. Um, the ALS, I think, and Caprino dinged it just a little bit. This was consistent. But my sense is, and this is what we see with a lot of cover crops. If we've got decent moisture, decent temperatures, microbes in the soil do a pretty good job of degrading many of our herbicides so they don't cause a big impact. All right, and when I looked at comparing the herbicide rates, my 1X, my penny crest yields were 933 pounds, my 2X was over 1,000. So the penny crest actually did better where there was more herbicide. And I can't explain that either. All right, so in the greenhouse, um, we did. What I'm calling dose response studies. So if you think about herbicides in the soil, they break down in something that's called a half-life. Uh, so say my half-life period is three weeks, I put out a pound, I come back three weeks later, if I could extract all the herbicide out of the soil, I'd find a half a pound there. If I came back six weeks later, I would find a quarter of a pound. If I came back nine weeks later, it would be an eighth of a pound. And you just keep going down the slope. Um, and the idea is you never get to zero, but you get closer and closer. So we set up these studies to simulate that kind of effect to say, how many half-lives do I need for these herbicides, which we know from data, will make it safe to plant pennycress. Okay, and so I'm gonna show the group 27 herbicides right here. So on the vertical axis, I have the weight of the pennycress that was in the little pots that we grew. Across the bottom, I've got the half-life sequence. So zero would be the full rate. This one, which I started with the HPPD herbicides, was your half rate. And what we found was by the time we got to this five half-lives, in most cases, Timbotrinum was the exception here, my pennycress was equal to what my untreated was. Okay, and if we look at the half-life period for most of these herbicides, it's about two weeks. So if I'm thinking about applying my herbicides no later than June 1st or June 7th, I've got plenty of time to get 75 days before I'm going to come and plant pennycress. And this principle works with our cover crops too. Those herbicides tend to break down. Um, group 15 herbicides, so dual harness, um, they have a little bit longer half-lives. And so they impacted further out, but again, most of the time that's going to be within the range that we would have using the pin crop. The herbicides that I was pretty excited about was Treflan. It's this black line. We really have not seen any injury from Treflan on pinnycress. And so that's one that we think may be a potential tool 
the weed management when we establish honey grass. All right, and this is data from a study that I started this last fall, where we looked at a number of herbicides that had seemed to be less injurious in our field study. And I looked at injury eight weeks after um, planting and herbicide establishment. And you can see trifluralin, topomizone, which is impact. This is shield X. Um, Cinezine was pretty low, which surprised me. Dicamba and clopyrolid all caused pretty minimal injuries. So they may have potentials um, for weed management and cover crest or pinny crest someday. All right, so in normal weather years, um, there are many herbicides that I think can be safely used for weed management in corn that wouldn't affect pennycrest in the fall. We we're just starting this year, similar studies with soybeans. We had our build, first field study last year. We we're starting greenhouse research right now, but there's gonna to need to be a lot of data so that we have things that we can use and rotate and then feed that crop legally to livestock. All right, my one soybean weed are of observation from this last year. Um, to manage herbicide resistant water hemp, what have we started doing? 20 years ago, what did we spray? Roundup, it worked great. Okay, uh, then we came out with this idea, Roundup's not working, so we need to add overlapping residuals. About the same time we got the dicamba and the 2,4-D technologies. And now we're, instead of using one or two herbicides, we're throwing a whole bunch of things into the tank. All right, we now have to do it in some ways to control the water. I don't have my water data up here, the dicamba and the Liberty helped wonders. But what I did notice is I started to see the last two years some pretty funky things on my grasses. This is data from my 2022 trial where I used glyphosate plus a group 15 herbicide. So the two that were in the trial were acetylchlor and esmetolachlor. I had virtually 100% control of my grass weeds. Right, where I threw Liberty into that mix with glyphosate and kept the group 15, I was pretty good. I was at 97, that would be acceptable. Um, but maybe a little bit of a knockoff. But where I added dicamba and group 15, what happened to my grass control? It dropped. I started to see escapes. And it was particularly true of just two species, fall panicum and large crabgrass. Um, I like Liberty. I worked on Liberty as an undergraduate student when I did an internship in Ohio back in the late 1990s. Um, but what's Liberty's Achilles heel when it comes to weeds? Panicum, okay, and grasses. So we are putting pressure on our grass system, both in terms of the mixtures that we're putting out with probably our best grass herbicide, which is glyphosate, and the fact that we're relying much more heavily on glufosinate, which is weak. So I put this slide up. Um, if you've seen something like this, I'd be interested in talking to you. If you haven't, this would be something I would encourage you to keep your eyes open for. Am I seeing any slippage in my grass control in the field? And could that be something to do with antagonism in the tank. And with that, thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions.